<laughs> Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Happy to have everyone here. What an incredibly beautiful view we have out our windows. By golly. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. You want to come by in July um, because you'll get to hear about Chris and uh, Chris Ray and Kim Jones, their trip to Africa. Chris is an incredibly great photographer, has blessed our uh, clubhouse with north of 35 uh, photographs on the walls, are all from Chris. And when they went to Africa, they took so many pictures that strung end to end, they can reach from here to Africa, in 8 and a half, 11 format, that is. And then, of course, you want to come by on June the 20th. Bob, uh, Michael Ellis will be here to talk all about uh, the Mojave Desert, how it was once uh, a lake. And now, of course, it's the deepest, hottest um, desert in America, in North America. Um, Bob Devlin will be here on June 13th to talk about racing Grand Prix cars on Marina Boulevard. You didn't know that happened because it was in 1915, but he'll be here to talk all about it. I asked Bob if he was here. He was, un he was unresponsive to that question. Uh, Carlo Ficino will be here to talk about a rowing from Norway to, who wants to guess? Iceland. It's not the most pleasant trip, but it was an incredible endurance adventure. They'll talk all about that. Janice Corvo will be here to talk about sailing around the world with her family for 10 years and her, as a guest appearance, her son, who is now a professional Grand Prix sailor, will be here. One of her two boys that went with her around the world. Uh, May 23rd, Bill Pearson will be here from North Sales to talk all about the new technology of 3DI sail design. Um, on the 16th of May, um, two-time Olympic gold medalist, seven-time world champion, and the chief of the U.S. Olympic sailing team, Malcolm Page, will be here to talk all about the U.S. Olympic sailing effort and how we can get back to the glory of the middle 80s when America reigned supreme in the sailing Olympics. Uh, and next week, uh, we will be honored with the presence of the famed naval architect Ron Holland, who will be here. We'll have a couple of Ron Holland boats uh, out in front, and Ron Holland will be here to talk about his book, uh, Designing by the Seat of My Pants. And those of us who remember Ron Holland in the days when he built incredibly fast 20 and 30 foot boats will be um, a pleased to discover that he's now doing 120 and 30 foot boats and even a couple of 200 foot boats. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing, um, uh, fun talk that he's going to give, and he'll show us how he basically has been doing this all, as he says, by the seat of his pants. Uh, I want to um, recognize that we have our rear Commodore, Kenny Glidewell, here. Kenny, and we have Staff Commodore Kimball Livingston, who once shared this podium for several years as a chairman. Nice to see you, Kimball. And uh, we have R.C. Keefe. Where's our senior Staff Commodore? R.C. Keefe is here. Holy moly. He's right here. And we have also Dewey Hines. Dewey, my bud, sailing bud and great sailor and Staff Commodore. Um, let's see. And we have, of course, our uh, committee member on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon Committee, Staff Commodore, former chairman of the board, and great all-around guy, our man Grant Settlemeyer. Grant, nice to see you here, buddy. And so it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce the Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club, the first female Commodore in our history. Please welcome our Commodore, Teresa Brandner. Teresa. Thank you, Ron, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome people in the room. Also, we have a, a strong online presence, so welcome to everyone who's watching online. Um, today's topic is, has a very warm place in my heart and everyone's heart here, uh, when anything about sailing. And so we are particularly pleased um, to welcome our guest from our reciprocal club and good friend, New York Yacht Club, and um, Steve Suchia is going to speak with us today, and we just want to give him a warm, warm welcome. We are so pleased that you're here and so pleased to have a fellow member or a member from New York Yacht Club join us. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. So people say they dream about things, and some say those dreams come true. Well, that's the case with our speaker today. As a 10-year-old, he sailed Flying Dutchman's in Columbus, Ohio, and a Flying Dutchman Juniors. At 26, he transi transitioned to thistles. And those of us who sail thistles know those are the original, incredible hot rod, um, really 
flat bottomed, incredibly fun boats. You hoist a thistle with two hands. You grab the spinnaker, you hoist the spinnaker on a thistle with two hands. You put the spinnaker in one hand and you put the halyard in the other and you go like this. <laughs> and the thistle goes up as fast as possible uh, so, as you don't, so that you don't run over it. Um, in 96, in 1996, he had the great pleasure to sail on the beautiful J-boat uh, Shamrock. And those of us who sailed in Shamrock, wow. J-boats are pretty crazy anyway, you know, 130-foot beauties. But Shamrock, um, in beautiful green and with incredible bronze f uh, fittings everywhere, it's just glistening. It looks like a showboat, and that's because it is a showboat, as well as being a fast boat. In 96, he got another sort of hook in his jaw about the America's Cup when he sailed on the 12-meter Intrepid. And then in uh, 2008, he found himself uh, um, on as a member of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. And um, he wrote a book in 2013 about the incredible, exciting races outside our window here, uh, Winging It. And uh, that book is a great book, published by McGraw-Hill. And he's written numerous articles uh, in the yachting press and in the yachting world about yacht racing, and especially about history, because he is, in fact, a historian and became, as of 2016, the chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Please welcome Steve Sushia. Steve, our bud. Okay, Tom, I think we're ready for the next slide. Thank you. All right, well, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, having me here at this wonderful club by the bay. And I was saying to Ron Young, it never gets old looking at the bay or driving across the Golden Gate Bridge. It's just, it's wonderful. It's also, of course, one of the greatest places to race and sell sailboats as well. So you have pretty much everything you need right here. And again, Commodore St. Francis, again, yeah, Teresa, thanks again for your kind comments. And uh, I'm so happy to see you and other flag officers here tonight or today. And um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today is to share with you the origin of the America's Cup. But it's going to be an unvarnished history of the origin of the America's Cup. There's a lot of myth out there. And there's a lot of stories that you've been listening to or hearing about and reading about over the years. What I'm going to share with you today is based on primary evidence. In other words, manuscripts and artifacts and paintings from that time. Manuscripts written by individuals, by committees, and others. By going directly to the primary evidence, you can really garner the truth of the matter. And how does this relate to the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee? Well, our selection committee is made up of individuals, historians, journalists, and other individuals who are intimately familiar with the America's Cup. And we take great care to examine the primary evidence and not base our judgments on rumors or secondary sources. And so what I'm going to share to you tonight or I'm sorry, I keep saying tonight because I usually speak in the evenings. This is the first time I've done a luncheon in a, in a while. Is that I want to share with you the methodology that individuals like myself and John Rumenier and Bob Fisher and William Collier and others do on a day-to-day -day basis to understand the history of yachting in the America's Cup. And so as you see the slides that I'm going to show you today, you're going to see things that have never been published before. I'm going to share with you some manuscripts from the Royal Yacht Squadron and the New York Yacht Club to help illustrate my story about the origin of the America's Cup. In front of you on the screen, uh, you can see the members of our selection committee. It's a wonderful group. We've got uh, Harriman Frares, who just joined recently. So he helps us with uh, understanding the design elements of uh, the history of the America's Cup and many other great names. It's a pleasure working with them because it's such a wealth of knowledge they have and it makes my job easy as we select candidates to induct in the America's Cup Hall of Fame. Now moving right along, specifically today, my talk, 
higher and faster, the origin of the America's Cup, I'm going to first talk about America and that race around the Isle of Wight in 1851, how she got into the race and how she did. Well, everybody knows how she did, but how she won it is going to be interesting, perhaps for many of you who may not be knowledgeable about the details of what happened in that race. Second, I'm going to go over how that America's Cup trophy became the holy grail of yachting, the perpetual challenge trophy. Next, I'll then discuss how that race in 1851 continues to influence the rules and the technology and the culture after all these years. And then finally, just a quick epilogue, I'll just go over details of the 2018 America's Cup Hall of Fame induction. So now let's begin our story. Our story begins in England in the Victorian era. And what I want to share with you is one of the great changes that occurred in the 19th century, which was the acceleration of the Industrial Revolution that started in England. And at the top was Queen Victoria presiding over the empire, an empire that spanned a quarter of the land's mass of earth at its height. And during the 1850s, Great Britain, the empire, controlled something like 90% of European steamship lines and business, and accounted for something like two-thirds of the coal production in the whole entire world. As a result, Great Britain, of course, was the superpower of the world. And as being the superpower of the world, they were also interested in taking a leadership role, and they did. Queen Victoria's husband, the great Prince Albert, came up with, came up with an idea in 1850 to create an international exposition to showcase science, technology, and art. A great exhibition, he would call it, where he can bring people, craftsmen, scientists, and others to London the next year in 1851 to share their design and technology. So he sent invitations out to all the leading countries of the world. And of course, some of those invitations landed in America specifically New York City. And here's an image of New York in 1851, which again, as we all know, was the nerve center of America, the young America. It was a place where it was the leader in financial and of course, uh, technology at that time. Since then, of course, I think San Francisco may have taken the lead, but. Uh, <laughs> Now, one of the groups in New York City at that time that took up the gauntlet to participate in the Great Exhibition was the New York Yacht Club. Behold, the New York Yacht Club. <laughs> and here it is. As Ron said, yes, this is their clubhouse in Hoboken, New Jersey. And, uh, exactly. Thank you. and by the way, the clubhouse... <laughs> Is, uh, you can actually visit it today. It's been heavily modified and uh, obviously been restored, but it's at Harbor Court in Newport if you ever want to see the, the little gingerbread clubhouse. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now, the ringleader of this group that wants to participate in this great exhibition was the New York Yacht Club's Commodore John Cox Stevens. Not only was he the club's first Commodore, but he was the primary founder of the club when it was started in 1844. Stevens was an industrialist who owned steamship lines and was one of the first uh, individuals to run railroad business in New Jersey. And one of the first people to drive a, a boat that was propeller uh, driven. And he was also a sportsman. Uh, he loved racing horses and of course, yacht racing. And oftentimes he equated yacht racing and horse racing with setting big, massive wagers. So he was an entrepreneur through and through. But at the same time, he was someone who also appreciated and understood technology. He and his brothers designed a yacht, the Yacht Maria, which is one of the fastest yachts at that time. His brother, also designed the T-rail for uh, you know, the railroad systems that we still use today. 
Now, John Cox Stevens said, I want to participate in this wonderful great exhibition next year in 1851. What I want to do is build a yacht, a yacht that could be a world beater, something to take on the British Empire. And so he created a syndicate of members to help support this project. So he brought on four individuals to join him to form a five-member syndicate. And one of the key members was George Schuyler. At that time, well, this is an, a painting that was done in the 1880s, but he was only 40 years old at that time. He was the youngest member of the syndicate. And George Schuyler served as the chief operating officer for the campaign. Schuyler was a civil engineer, but who was also deeply involved in the railroad business and the steamship businesses as well. And just like Stevens, he was a yachtsman, of course. Stevens and Schuyler's then went to George Steers, the young George Steers, who was only 32 years old at that time in 1851. And Steers had created a wonderful reputation as being one of the top designers of both steam vessels and yachts, as well as pilot boats that plied the ways of New York Harbor. Steers was selected in part because of his great success in designing pilot boats that took pilots out to uh, steamships coming into uh, New York Harbor. Pilot boats had to be fast because it was first come, first serve. So he who made it the steamship first to guide in got the business. Now, George Steers uh, was then commissioned around approximately around November of 1850 or so by Stevens and Schuyler to build this world-beating yacht. And over the course of the winter of 1850 and into the winter of 1851, and finally in spring, in May of May 3rd of 1851, the yacht America was launched. And here's a little wonderful image showing the yacht being launched between 11th and 12th Street on the East River of Manhattan. And the thing that's striking is they decided to call her America. Now think about that. I think that was bold, and I think it was totally emblematic of what their mission was all about. It wasn't just about racing a boat to win some prizes. No, they wanted to demonstrate American shipbuilding and be a symbol of yachting prowess as well when they went overseas. The yacht, here's a little drawing of the yacht at the time she was launched. And actually, what do you notice about her that's peculiar from, uh, yeah, she has a white hull. Yeah, many images you see of her has a black top size, the raking black, uh, I mean, it was the raking uh, mass and the black hull. But at the time she was launched, she had this pale light gray color. And um, so I'm showing the image as she was in 1851, she was launched. So here's some stats on the boat, 90 feet on deck, 89 feet on the water line, displaced by 170 tons, and a max draught of about 11 feet. Now, meanwhile, as she was being launched, the Great Exhibition finally opened in Hyde Park in London. And the Great Exhibition's headquarters was the Crystal Palace, which was built to showcase 25 countries that participated in this wonderful exposition. And this great exhibition ran from May 3rd all the way till the end of October that year, drawing something like six million visitors from all over the world. And uh, let's go inside. This was the moment when uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert inaugurated the uh, opening of the great exhibition. Here's a quick scene showing the, the different artifacts. There were things like, uh, Goodyear rubber tire, I mean Goodyear rubber demonstrations of vulcanizational rubber, and there were things like Colt Navy pistols, and you had sculptures, among other things. Now let's go back to New York. So in the mid of uh, mid-May or so, that's when uh, the syndicate decided to test out this new toy that they built. And so here in this image by Courier and Ives, you can see the Yacht American in the background, and in the foreground is the yacht Maria, the one designed by the Stevens brothers. And as it turns out, in the trial runs, Yacht America got consistently beat by Maria. 
Maria had a great sail area, as you can see, and she had a very light displacement because she had a very shallow draft and a big centerboard. Then you might say, well, why didn't they take her over to uh, England? Well, exactly, she couldn't make it. As soon as she probably gets 20 or 30 miles out to Atlantic, she probably will fall apart. She was a thoroughbred and very lightly designed. Meanwhile, America was designed specifically to handle the rigors of sailing across the Atlantic. So therefore, the syndicate, while somewhat concerned, was not devastated. But let's begin. So July, uh, June 21st, 1851, the yacht America leaves New York and begins their adventure. Now, the syndicate members, they took a steamship while uh, <laughs> the designer and some of the crews, yes, they had to sail the Yacht America. Approximately mid-July, uh, the Yacht America made to Le Havre as well as the steamships. And this is interesting. They decided to stop in France for a couple of reasons. Number one, to do some repairs and maintenance and get Yacht America in trim, but also for the syndicate members to go look and shop for wine. So Stevens was a huge wine fanatic. And one of the things they brought along with them was a cask, or, no, I'm sorry, was bottles of 50-year-old Madeira on board the America to celebrate perhaps a victory or to toast the queen. Now, they took a little detour to uh, Paris. And, um, and while they were in Paris, they met with uh, the legendary and iconic New York newspaper uh, editor, Horace Greeley. And I think Greeley perfectly captures the sentiment of many Americans regarding this America adventure. So Greeley said to Stevens, he said, the eyes of the world are upon you. You will be beaten, and our country will be abused. So you better not go over there. But of course, Stevens ignored that, and he said, look, <laughs> I think we've got a winner here. As it also turned out, the ambassador to Paris, William Reeves, also carried the same sentiment. And he was also cautioning John Cox Stevens for venturing out across the Solent to race. So that was, again, an important, I think, factor in this wonderful story, because nobody was really expecting America to do much good. Well, at La Havre, they... Uh, underwent some repairs. They added some uh, features to the Yacht America, but one of the great features, they painted her black. And they got her into more or less racing trim. And here we have this painting of America sailing across the, Sol I mean, across the English Channel, and they headed to the Isle of Wight, to the playground of yachting at that time. The Isle of Wight, you know, as you can see, is just south of Southampton. It's about 23 miles wide and about 13 miles north-south. And the Solent is the body of water, as many of you know, that rings the top. In fact, how many of you have sailed on the Solent here? Fantastic. And can somebody describe what the conditions are like on the Solent? Currents. Currents. Yes, exactly. Currents, tricky, one of the, one of the challenging places to race, especially... If you, don't, if you haven't grown up racing there, for sure. Here's some images I took of uh, the, the Isle of Wight when I was back there in 2015. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to share with you some color photos of the Isle of Wight and activities in that part of the world, just to personalize the, the presentation. Now, the Yacht America proceeded to go up the Solent towards their destination, Cows. They were going to Cowes because earlier that year, the Commodore of the Royal Yacht Squadron invited Stevens to come pay a visit. And so going up the, uh, the Solent from the eastern point towards Cowes, America started to edge up towards a destination. And then when the mist kind of passed by, it revealed a, an English cutter, the Lavrock, one of the fastest Royal Yacht Squadron boats. And John Cox Stevens, who was on board America by that time, just couldn't help himself. He said, let's do a little pickup race. So he signaled the Lavrock's captain, and he said, let's do a little quick run between here and Cowes. And they did. And as it turned out, America, despite the fact that she was not fully optimized, was able to smoke Lavrock. 
And by the time that she arrived in Cowes, word got out that this strange, low freeboard, black hauled, raked back mast, piratical looking vessel is something to be concerned about. Here we have uh, cows in the 1850s. On the right-hand side, you can see the, uh, the castle, which was built in the time of Henry VIII to defend the mouth of the River Medina. And then the little town of cows. That's right. And today, we have the cows castle, which is occupied by the squadron. And you can see the famous uh, red and white striped platform where they run their races. Here's a view from 2015 showing the lawn looking out onto the Solent. What you're looking at here is the primary area where they start and finish races. Now, John Cox Stevens first met with uh, Lord Wilton when he got there. This is around August 2nd or 3rd or so. And uh, naturally, Stevens wanted to get racing. And Lord Wilton said, sure, I can help you. Stevens said, I would like to race against any schooner that's in the, uh, the English, uh, or anywhere, the, the United Kingdom, anyone. He said, I would love to participate in a regatta or a match race, what have you. But Lord Wilton backed off and said, well, well, we don't have much time to arrange a race, so I'm afraid I can't do that for you. Then Stevens came back with a counter offer and said, okay, that's fine, but I would like to then send a challenge to any one cutter or any schooner for a match race. And Lord Wilton accepted, and he sent out a circular to 17 of the leading clubs in the British Isles at that time looking for comers. But as it turned out, there weren't any. Perhaps it was because of the uh, Lavrock America issue, or perhaps, who knows? Well, so out of frustration, Lord uh, John Cox Stevens went back to Lord Wilton and said, "Hey, you know what can I do? There must be something. I came here all day from across the Atlantic." So Lord Wilton did say, "Well, I'd like to invite you, however, to a race on August 22nd. It's a race around the Isle of Wight." You're not going to get anything other than a cup, but uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to test your wonderful yacht. But interestingly enough, Stevens did not immediately accept that invitation. Instead, he pressed for another type of challenge. So he, I have to go through this because there's so many little details here. So he said, well, let's try another challenge. Send another circular out and just say, while a cup is fine, I prefer a wager. And this wager shall not exceed 10,000 guineas. And keep in mind, 10,000 guineas was approximately more than two times more than the cost of building the Yacht America. And 2,000 guineas translated to American dollars at that time was about $54,000. And that was at a time when the middle, average um, middle income individual was making about $2,000 per year. So the scale of these bets were just massive. Well, unfortunately, he still got no response from anyone. Finally, however, the Royal Victoria Yacht Club around the middle of August finally said, why don't you come join us and race in our fleet race? But then, a couple of days later, the Royal Victoria Yacht Club said, I'm sorry, you can't participate because you're owned by a syndicate. In our races, you have to own, you have to be singly owned. And so, again, another disappointment. And the funny thing is, uh, one of the great manuscripts that remain to this day is the logbook written by James Steers, the brother of George Steers. And he can get wonderful insight into what was going on at that time. So I want to just read to you a quote of how Stevens reacted to the Royal Victoria Yacht Club's reneging on their, their offer. And this is dated like August 12th. And this is a line from the log that James Steers personally kept. And he said, and in this is a response to the decline. He said, this, may, this made us all downhearted. Old pig got mad. And that's what uh, Steers called John Cox Stevens. <laughs> old pig got mad. He went ashore to the clubhouse and asked if our challenge of 50,000 pounds was accepted. And because it was answered in the negative, the sum being too much, 
He then wrote the third and last challenge to sail against any vessel in England, Ireland, or Scotland for the sum of 10,000 pounds out in the open channel, six hours to windward and back, and to blow six knots and upwards. And that was the last proposition. So as you can see, this is a, an individual who's just trying everything he can to make a match. And everywhere he turns, he's just being denied. Well, eventually, there were individuals who raised their hand and said, I would love to race you, including the Marquis of Cunningham, who said, I would love to take out a race, but I want to stay in the Solent. And then Stephen said, no. My boat, I think, is designed for ocean racing. We need to race on the English Channel. Again, he was denied. And so there was no race there. Finally, to make <laughs> this long and arduous and painful story short, Stevenson, Robert Stevenson, a friend of John Cox Stevens, a feral railroad magnate, said, fine, I'll race you. We'll race in the ocean. I'll meet your needs. And we'll race for 500 pounds. Let's set the date for August 28th. And so finally, after much, much arduous journey, Stevens finally got what he wanted. Now, then after that, he said, I would like to also participate in the uh, Royal Yacht Squad and 100-pound race around the Isle of Wight as well. So he also accepted to com uh, commit America in the race on August 22nd. And what you see in front of you right here is a, a flyer that the Royal Yacht Squad prepared for that race. And you might say, what was the genesis for this race around the Isle of Wight, open to all nations? And I think that was fascinating to me because it was the first time ever that an international yacht race was, uh, was scheduled. And went back in 2005, I had the wonderful opportunity to spend time at the Royal Yacht Squadron to research their archives. And one of the items I decided to look through were the minutes, which record the various uh, activities of the squadron. And I found this book right here, the minutes that covers the 1850s. And turning to the page of uh, May 9th of 1851, I found the entry that discussed here, the fifth point, that the squadron has agreed to mount a race for August 22nd, open to all nations. So here was this primary source looking at this material, the very genesis in part of the Great America's Cup story. Also, incidentally, the third point mentioned that um, Nathaniel Alexander, Esquire, and Viscount Chetwind, having failed to pay their dues, are no longer members of the club. So make sure you pay your dues. Going back to the Yacht America, what I want to share with you now is what are some of the differences of this wonderful racing craft was compared to her competitors. So as you know, Yacht America was an original boat. She was distinctly different from the typical English cutter and English schooner that she was going up against. And here in this diagram, you can see on the top the profile of a typical cutter and below the Yacht America. And you can see the differences are quite clear. Note the uh, blunt bow of the, of the cutter while you have the clipper bow of Yacht America. And note the uh, overhang on the stern of the cutter. But let's now flip the boats and look from the underwater profile. And you can see that the cutter is very wide near the, the front of the vessel. Meanwhile, by stark contrast, the Yacht America is very sharp and hollow bowed. And the widest point is just past her midships. So when the English sailors had their close inspection of Yacht America cows, they really were startled. In fact, the Marquis of Anglesey, one of the members of the Royal Yacht Squadron, when she saw the Yacht America, she said, I think I've been sailing my yacht backwards all my life. <laughs> and he has another great quote, too. He said, if she is right, if America is right, then we're all wrong. And then finally, he had to really see him for himself. So he got an invitation from Stevens, accepted to go on board Yacht America, and he got a tour. And he was wondering, you know, how, you know, what's going on with this boat? You know, how she just destroyed and defeated Lavrock. So he was leaning over the stern to see if there was a propeller. And he actually leaned so far that he almost fell overboard. And with James Alexander Hamilton, 
one of the members of the group grabbed his leg. And actually, it was the peg leg, the leg that he lost at the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> you know? And he was successfully able to bring back the 80-year-old Marquis. So. Now, one of the key factors in this story is also about rating. You know, again, you will notice like, in the conversations that John Cox Stevens had with uh, potential uh, people to race against, and as well as the Royal Yacht Squadron saying, we will not have any time allowance or any handicap. It was largely based on the fact that England was using a very different rating system than in America. And here's an example. I just want to share you, with you why many of these races, like the race we're going to be talking about, was done without any handicapping. If you look at the top boat, that's a typical English schooner, 100 feet on the waterline. And then below, you got the Yacht America at 89 feet on the waterline. Now, in the United States, yes, Yacht America would be given time by the English schooner, right? Generally speaking, the longer the waterline, the faster the boat is. However, in England, they measure things a little bit differently. You can see here that, ironically, the longer waterline boat would have a shorter rated length and the Yacht America would be penalized. And the reason is because in England, you dropped a plumb bob from the bow of your boat, then you measured from that point back towards the bottom of the rudder post. And the English designers got savvy, so they started to design boats that have this sharply angled rudder to artificially reduce your rating. In America, you had a system called cubicle contents to uh, measure the boats, so there was no rationale for shifting the rudder back. Now let's begin. So as August 22nd got close to that big race, John Cox Stevens and his group decided to do some further enhancements. And in the spirit of what I call Kaizen, they decided to uh, add some extra horsepower. So they added a jib boom, as you can see. Here, let's look at the difference. So here's her before the modification, and then here she is afterwards. So extra sail area by adding a flying jib boom and a flying jib, and also adding a topsail at the top. And here's the date, August 22nd, 1851, the day has come for the Yacht America to participate in the Royal Yacht Squadron 100-pound cup to race around the Isle of Wight, open to all nations. And this is a race that uh, involved eight cutters, single-masted vessels, and seven schooners, two or more masts. And it was a race that went clockwise around the Isle of Wight, which was a 53-mile course. And the, back then, the way they started races were you were all anchored at the start. The, in this case, the cutters were in the front row and the schooner was behind. And when the uh, st uh, preparatory gun went off, then you begin and get into position. And when the start gun goes off, you raise your anchor. Then you're off and running. And this is crazy. It's like a movie where... So the gun goes off, the cutters are off, and the schooners follow soon. But what happens to America? Well, she actually ran over her anchor, <laughs> okay? And well, it came to a dead stop. Everybody else, all 14 other boats were, were sailing across down the Solent. Yet America had to restart. They had to raise the anchor back up, take and readjust their sails, and then begin their uh, journey forward. So they started dead last. Not a great start. Here's a photograph from the 2015 bicentenary just showing you at the point where America would have started. And you can see this, right? This is the battlements of the castle. Now, the race, again, was, it was experiencing about 11 knots of wind from the southwest. So the first leg was pretty much a uh, reach. And at times, it shifted and it was a run as well. But interesting enough, the Yacht America, despite starting dead last, within one hour into the race, about nine miles, 
across the top of the Solent, she really started to pick up speed. And she went from 15th all the way up to fifth place after the first hour. And only the little yacht Volant was in the lead. Now, to illustrate what it looked like, this is a watercolor from, the 18, from 1852 that shows the Solent at the time of, in the middle of the 19th century. And this is a wonderful picture. It was painted by none other than Queen Victoria. And it was painted from her property, Osborne House, looking out onto the Solent. And just uh, as a shout out to St. Francis, this is a group of photo, this is a group photo that I took of your group at the Royal Yacht Squadron Bicentenary in front of Osborne House. So imagine one of those windows up there with Queen Victoria looking out and painting watercolors of the Solent. Now, as they, as they neared the eastern point, the yacht Volante remained in the lead. This is one of the small cutters of the fleet. But the America started to pick up speed and gain more speed, especially as it became more of a reach. And by the time they got to the point, to the eastern point, America took the lead. And here's the painting that's hung at the Royal Yacht Squadron that features the Yacht America taking the lead. It's magnificent, isn't it? One of the advantages of the Yacht America wasn't just her hull shape, it was her rig and her sails. She had very flat cotton sails, and they were lashed at the bottom, at the foot, which made it very efficient and effective. Compared to the English boats, which were made of flax, which are overly flexible, and they were not uh, tied or lashed to the boom. They were loose-footed. So at around 11.47 a.m., they round the, the point, and they begin the arduous beat to St. Catherine's Point. America made 16 tacks in this leg to windward. But what was interesting that was happening was as America reached the point there, there were some grumblings on board the boat because they were saying, I've noticed that when we were rounding the east point, some of our competitors were rounding the nab light, which is about two miles roughly from the eastern point. We, we didn't round that. We just took the inside. Some of us followed us, and others, however, took the nab light. And they looked at the instructions and it says, just round the Isle of Wight. So they said, I think we're safe. But they were kind of confused. Then they said, well, let's just race it and see what happens. See what the squadron decides at the end. And more on that later. But also as they were approaching the point, the southern point, they noticed one of their yachts that was close behind them, the yacht Arrow, run aground at Noah Bay. So right there, you had 15, now you got 14. Uh, one of the boats went out to uh, help her, as well as a steamship, and so really you had 13 competitors now. Now, my question to you all is, why didn't the Yacht America run aground? These were the out-of-towners. Local knowledge. Yeah, look, exactly. They had a secret weapon. Yeah, his name was uh, Robert Underwood. He was an English pilot through and through who lived on the Isle of Wight. You see, a few days before the start of the race, John Cox Stevens said, we need to make sure we got an edge, too. We don't want to be at a disadvantage. So he approached the local consulate at Southampton and said, I want you to go find me a pilot that's excellent and also somebody we can trust. And enter Robert Underwood. In addition to that, they wanted to fortify the boat with additional sailors, so they went out looking for English yachtsmen as well. So the boat actually had several English sailors on board. Of the 21 crew members, something like five were not American. Now, as they round the bottom point and heading towards the iconic needles, America really got into her stride. She started to really take on a great margin over her opponents on this wonderful reach. Here's a wonderful painting by Russ Kramer that really captures the essence and feel as they approach the needles. And at 5.50 p.m., the Yacht America rounded the western point, the Needles, and began the next phase. And it was at this point 
that Yacht America was about five miles ahead of her most, re of her most closest competitor, the Yacht Aurora. And that's when uh, the famous moment occurred, when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, who were on board their royal yacht, was observing the race. Queen Victoria asked her courtier, so who's first? Who do you see? So the courier took out his telescope, and he said, the Yacht America, ma'am. And then she inquired, so who is second? <laughs> he took out his telescope and scanned the horizon. And he said, ma'am, there is no second. <laughs> okay. That's right. And this image right here by Russ Kramer captures that moment when John Cox Stevens, who you can see on the, the, uh, the starboard side, doffing his cap with his crew, paid their respects. And they lower the yacht ensign as well as they pass the royal yacht you see on the left. And then began the final slow run to the finish. And this became agonizing and actually scary for Yacht America because this little Aurora boat was just five miles you know, away at the point when they rounded the needle, started to catch up because the wind started to die and die and die. And this is really when the crew of Yacht America was sweating bullets because that five mile lead just evaporated. And you, we've all experienced this as racing sailors when that happens, you know, <laughs> okay. You've done so well and all of a sudden, uh, well, however, so here, oh, by the way, here's a wonderful image by uh, Thomas Dutton of the Yacht America on that final run. You can see how they're blow, uh, blowing out the, uh, the booms and sailing wing on wing. And this is a, a lithograph from the, uh, the Great Mariners Museum in Newport News, which, by the way, have the, uh, the AC-72 that won the cup here in 2013. And finally, at 837, Yacht America crosses the line. Boom. And she wins just by about 20 to 30 minutes ahead of Aurora. Okay. And it finished again at 8.37 p.m., so it was getting dark. And, and about 20 minutes later, the fireworks started. <laughs> and then throughout the fireworks, the other boats that followed started to drift in. But some of the last boats finished around 2 a.m. in the morning. And so here's a picture of the squadron from the western side, which the Yacht America would have seen as she crossed the line. Now, but was it over right there? It wasn't over, because the next day, Stevens was greeted by a member of the squadron and said, uh, actually, you're being protested. So George Akers, who happens to own the biggest boat, the Yacht Brilliant, is protesting you for uh, not complying with the rules. He said, remember when you rounded that eastern point, you didn't round the nab light. You took an inside cut and saved about 10 minutes. And so the squadron committee reviewed this. And thankfully, they did the right thing. They discovered that the Yacht America crew received a set of instructions that was different from half of the competitors. Half of them received a course that said, round the Isle of Wight, like, like America. And the others said, the course is the Queen's course, which means you're around the nap light. But the squadron did the right thing, and they were gracious enough, of course, to award the trophy to John Cox Stevens and the Yacht America. So behold, the Yacht America's prize, the silver trophy now known as the America's Cup. Now, the funny thing about the cup was it was just a uh, store-bought trophy. There were like several of these in existence. So the member, a member of the squadron bought like a couple of them, uh, from a uh, jewelry store in London, Gerard's. And um, it was just simply an off-the-shelf trophy. And what's fascinating is this off-the-shelf trophy is now the Holy Grail. But before we leave England and get into the second phase of our discussion, there was that match race which Stevens really wanted. And so against his friend Robert Stevenson, the Yacht America and Stevens, Stevenson's Titania met on the 28th off the Isle of Wight to race in the English Channel. 
And in that race, which the first leg was a downwind leg for 20 miles, America led that bottom mark by four minutes and 12 seconds over his competitor. And on the beat back, she was able to just crush Titania, winning by 52 minutes. And there he went and got his 500 pound prize. Now, I wanted to share that match racing story with you just because it was such an important moment for Stevens. I mean, again, his point of view of sailboat racing is, again, not just winning a race, but also getting a, a bet won. Now, all, with all this fantastic news with Yacht America winning, it really captured the, the whole country in, in Great Britain. And, of course, over time, it had spread to uh, overseas back to America. The interest in the America's Cup was massive. I mean, the interest of that race on August 22nd was massive. In fact, a London Times reporter who took the train in from London to Cowes to visit this amazing boat that defeated 14 of the best boats of Great Britain said while he was on the carriage ride into town, all he heard was his people talking about this amazing Yacht America. And when he got there, again, there were thousands who just wanted to clamor and see this amazing yacht. And among that group was Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, who paid a visit to Stevens and the yacht. And here's a wonderful painting showing Queen Victoria meeting Stevens and Prince Albert in the foreground. And the story goes, Queen Victoria took her handkerchief and uh, inspected the, uh, the cabinetry on board the yacht. And the fact that she couldn't find any dust on that was very, very impressed. You know. <laughs> So impressed that she also gave a gold sovereign to all the members of the crew for their great work. But to me, that was fascinating. I think that was an incredible point in this whole story because it really made Stevens proud of what he did and George Steers as well for designing such an amazing craft. And this connection to royalty continues. Here's the Duchess of Cambridge with uh, Ben Ainsley. This is a photo I took back in 2015 during one of the America's Cup World Series. They like each other, right? Yeah, because somebody was saying, will the Duchess be involved again with the, with the Royal Yacht Squadron Challenge, with the change in the financial element of it? And I would say yes, because I think this is evidence, primary evidence, that the Duchess <laughs> likes Ben Ainsley. <laughs> <laughs> and the tradition and the connection with the Royal Yacht Squadron and the New York Yacht Club was also solidified by that 1851 race. Here, after the bicentenary uh, in 2015 to celebrate the 200th birthday of the squadron, the New York Yacht Club gave a wonderful gift to the squadron. So here we have Commodore Reeves Potts and his wife Nancy presenting a wonderful silver trophy to Christopher Sharples and his wife Gaynor in front of the squadron door. And inside the squadron, this is uh, against the wall inside the platform there are many icons related to the Yacht America at the castle, at the squadron's headquarters. So you can see above me and Maldwin Drummond, who was my host, who was a former commodore of the uh, Royal Yacht Squadron. You can see the Yacht America in that little box at the top. There's also a silver model of the America in, in a prime position in the squadron's clubhouse. And that wonderful painting that I showed you earlier, that graces one of the living rooms. Here I am just presenting the Cameron Lake Sailing Association Burgee to uh, Baldwin Drummond, former Commodore of the Squadron. Now, now what did Stevens do after this little win against the Titania? Well, again, because he was frustrated in not being able to win the massive pounds and pound sterlings, he decided to do something what a good businessman would do. He understood that it cost him $23,700 to construct the boat and campaign the yacht. So what he ended up doing was he sold the boat right there and then in England right after these races. At a, so it basically was dumping a stock at its 52-week high. <laughs> so he sold the yacht for $24,450 to an English yachtsman. And with a little money he got from the Titania match, you have a profit of $1,227. <laughs> Success. <laughs> and that closes the first section of our talk. We're almost there now. So with that trophy in hand, they took a steamship back home to New York. 
and they were greeted with great pride and great uh, affection from the people of New York and, and actually from Washington as well. Daniel Webster, one of the great uh, you know, congressmen said, like Jupiter among gods, America is first and there is no second. And throughout the whole Eastern Seaboard, people were just celebrating the success against the former, I mean, against the great British Empire. In fact, just like the Yacht America's victory captured the imagination of the English public, in America, it happened as well. So newspapers wrote a ton of articles about it, and I'm going to show you later uh, afterwards, I brought some sheet music where music uh, makers were all producing and taking advantage of the Yacht America mania. And George Templeman Strong, George Templeman Strong, one of the great New York diarists uh, who was living at that time, said, newspapers crowing over the victory of Stephen's yacht, which has beaten everything in the British seas. I'm sorry, newspapers are crowing over the victory of Stephen's yacht, which has beaten everything in the British seas. Quite credible to Yankee shipbuilding, certainly, but not worth the intolerable vainglorious vaporings that make every newspaper I take up now ridiculous. One would think that yacht building were the end of man's existence on earth. <laughs> now in that context, the New York Yacht Club hosted the victors at a wonderful dinner at the Astor House on Broadway, just above Wall Street. Here you can see uh, the Astor House Hotel to the right. Right next door, you have St. Paul's Chapel, right? And down the street, you can see Trinity Church. To the left is uh, P.T. Barnum's Museum. And this is a picture from 1851 or so, or 52. So this is a very contemporary image of what it looked like at that time. So on October 1st, 1851, the New York Yacht Club honored John Cox Stevens and the crew and the uh, syndicate leaders of the Yacht America although they actually didn't invite George Steers and some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the captain of the boat, which created a lot of uproar among the newspapers, saying, why did you, uh, you know, do such a thing? But at that time, of course, with the way that worked in society, individuals like boat builders or designers were of, perhaps, I'm afraid, a lower class. Thankfully, that has changed. <laughs> Today, this is what it looks like, the staples. You know, that's the Astor building. It's been modified. It's a new building altogether. But Staples, that's the location where that party was. Here's an interior of the Astor House in 1851. And at that dinner, John Cox Stevens addressed his fellow members of the New York Yacht Club. And he was so taken by their hospitality, by his fellow members, that he presented the cup to the club as a gift. And he said, instructions and a little deed of gift will follow. So it's not just a, a prize to look at, but it will be a prize where we can use it for some purpose. And that leads to that document, the deed of gift. So over the course of that winter of 1851, spilling into uh, 1852 and into the spring, members of the owners of America met together to draft the prescription for owning the America's Cup. And like I said earlier today, I want to share with you some of the primary evidence that we historians love to look at. And so I want to show you something that's not been published anywhere yet. And this is the original deed of gift. Yep. And this is... Uh, held at the archives of the New York Yacht Club. In fact, some of you might have seen this. Ha has anyone seen the original here? Tom has, yeah, yeah, you have, fantastic. About back in 2004 or five or so, I spent uh, an entire week just going through the papers related to the deed of gift. And it really was a valuable experience because when you look at the actual primary evidence, you notice things that are not written typically in secondary sources. I want you to look at, take a look at this document. Let's all play historian and look at it. Do you see anything odd about this document? 
Yes, somebody said that. You're right. They changed the date. Anything else? Yeah, crossed out the signatures. I was wondering, what is up with that? <laughs> well, part of a historian is like being a detective, and so I decided to snoop around, and I found the minutes from 1857. And I discovered that the history of the founding of the cup is a little bit more trickier and murkier than really at, at first glance. You see, the traditional history of the America's Cup is that on July 8th, 1857, the members of the former Yacht America donated the cup to the New York Yacht Club and life went on. But it wasn't that simple. And just like as you saw, the crossed out signatures and the crossed out date. In fact, let's just look at that crossed out date here. Let's zoom in. I started to question what went on. Well, as it turned out, when George Schuyler, the key author of the Deed of Gift, completed the original Deed of Gift in May or so of 1852, he forwarded that document to John Cox Stevens for approval and his signatures. But for reasons we don't know, Stevens never forwarded that Deed of Gift to, to the New York Yacht Club. It was only until several years later, in June of 1857, when Stevens died, that about a month later, George Schuyler showed up to the New York Yacht Club and said, I've got a copy of what we wrote back in 1852. I don't have the original, because that's since been lost. I hope you can still accept this. And that's why he crossed out and redated it and also put those cross lines on the signatures. Now, the minutes are very clear. The club accepted that version of the deed of gift and thus the America's Cup as it stands today was born. Now, we're, here we are at the final run now. As I said earlier, the America's Cup deed of gift and the America's Cup race in 1851 continues to impact the races today. The key thing is this, it remains, the America's Cup remains a sport that is all about technology. It's about building the fastest yacht this is not a one design contest, as, as we all know. And that's in really in part to the heritage that was created by Prince Albert and the Great Exhibition, which is about showcasing technology. So here are some images of cup races since 1857. Here are some boats in the 1890s, Columbia and Shamrock. Here's Charlie Barra at the helm of Reliance in 1903. Take a look at that. She had like an aluminum deck. Here's the J-Class of the 1930s. Even though it was a class model, it was still promoted technology and advancements in design. Then after World War II, we got this wonderful, beautiful image of 12 meters. Again, technology continued to improve. And then in 1983, we had the famous winged keel from down under which is the epitome of technological advancement during the 12-meter era. And that particular race was very special because it really echoed that 1851 race where you had a country that was considered smaller beating the superpower. And just as America celebrated with great joy in 1851, Australia did in 1983. There's another element of the America's Cup, <clears throat> Dieter Gift, from the 1850s that impact the sport today. And is this 1988 race, which Tom Eamon right in front of me was in, involved critically. In 1988, as you all know, the New Zealanders, well, just to make sure, the New Zealanders challenged the San Diego Yacht Club, but the San Diego Yacht Club evaded them. They didn't want, just like the way a lot of the Englishmen did in the face of uh, John Cox Stevens during that summer. But, why was there a race in 1988? Because the deed of gift, when it was written in the 1850s, had a clause in it. And I just wanted to show you this quick excerpt. In yellow, you can see that if the parties are in disagreement as to the terms of holding a match, 
the deed of gifts prescribes what you're supposed to do in a situation. They says the mass shall be raised, sailed over the usual course of the annual god of the yacht club in possession of the cup. And that's one of the geniuses of the deed of gift. And in that, that clause was likely connected to the fact that Stevens was facing all that frustration. And that's why I was going over that on and on and on early in the conversation here today. And that particular clause also helped out in 2007 when the Swiss defended the cup successfully. But they had certain, let's say, rules and regulations that were not amenable to the, the new challengers. So Larry Allison, through Golden Gate Yacht Club, challenged the terms of the protocol. The Swiss team disagreed, and they said, we refuse to uh, go with your terms. It went to court. The court ruled that according to the deed of gift, if the two parties, the challenge and the defender, can't agree, there must be a race. And again, following the prescription of the deed of gift, there was a race in 2010, and here are some photos of that wonderful race. Now keep in mind the deed has been amended since that original one in 1852, but the heart and soul of it remains the same. And this technological emphasis and the fact that the deed of gift allows the cup to move through difficulties. Hey, we saw this last year in Bermuda. We went from monohulls with the J class, 12 meters and the big class of the 1800s to the catamarans that we saw in 2010 and 13, and of course in Bermuda last year. And now we're with monohulls at hydrofoil. Some scenes from the Bermuda race last year, and the wonderful victory by New Zealand. And then the final point I want to make about the influence of that 1851 race that's still felt to this day, we have Peter Burling, Right, skipper, or rather helmsman, I should say, of the team from New Zealand. But the guy on the far right, Glenn Ashby, far left, on the far left, Glenn Ashby, he's not a New Zealander, he's an Australian. And he was the team's uh, kind of like spiritual leader and one of the top catamaran racer uh, sailors in the world. But again, the fact that the America's Cup team continues to uh, employ both you know, nationals, of the country of origin, as well as foreigners to supplement the team's strength, is also tied back to the 1851 race because the deed of gift does not and never has required that the crew be nationals of a country. And one can infer the reason why there was no mention of that kind of requirement in the deed of gift by Stevens and Schuyler was due to the fact they had a man like Robert Underwood to help them to have local knowledge experts on your team. And that sometimes means hiring foreigners to achieve your goal. And so the America's Cup lives on. And it's fascinating, again, to see all these changes we're seeing now. And it's fun to trace it all the way back to that summer of 1851. So that ends my little quick story on the origin. And I just want to quickly finish up with the Hall of Fame. So just bear with me here. So I just want to let you know I'm proud to announce that the America's Cup Hall of Fame 2018 induction ceremony will be held at the Royal Yacht Squadron on August 31st of this year. We're going to induct Doug Peterson. We had the late and great designer who came up with that rocket ship in 1995 that won the Cup for New Zealand. And we have John Marshall, the great 12-meter Yachtsman with the team Dennis Connor and great project manager with Stars and Stripes in 87 and in 88. Then we have Sid Fisher. While he has not won the cup, he was a persistent challenger and he always brought about a fun environment. And he was also one of the men that found and discovered the great Jimmy Spittle. And last but not least, Ken McAlpine, the measurer of measurers a man who's been measuring 12 meters and the current boats with great s- skill and diplomacy. And then, as a special note, we're also going to be honoring Sir Richard Sutton, who uh, will be receiving a special medal that will 
honor individuals who uphold the spirit of friendly competition in the America's Cup. So we're creating a new medal that will be launched at the squadron to honor a former Royal Yacht Squadron individual, Sir Richard Sutton, the fifth baronet, who in 1885 demonstrated great sportsmanship in that match. And to learn more about uh, attending the event, you can go to the uh, Harrisoft Marine Museum, America's Cup Hall of Fame site at www.harrisoft.org. And as a final note, for those who want to do further research to look at things like primary sources or get a good start, I just want to share with you some fun and great and useful online resources. At the America's Cup Hall of Fame, we have a wonderful index and database that can help you research America's Cup teams. And on cupinfo.com, Robert Caymans and myself has created a bibliography of America's Cup books. We have about 900, and, uh, close to 900 titles now, and it's annotated for your, your knowledge as well and, exp and for your convenience. So anyway, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate uh, your patience and listening to my talk. Welcome again to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club in our beautiful grill room. Um, our speaker today is uh, America's Cup historian and chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee, uh, Steve Sushia. Steve, when did you first get interested in the America's Cup? What's the moment? Can you remember the first time you heard the term America's Cup? What age were you and where were you? Yeah, I was... Uh... I was in eighth grade, um, and uh, I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio. And because when the uh, America's Cup was uh, won by the Australians in that remarkable victory, it got so much press that even the Cincinnati Enquirer picked up the news <laughs> and shared the awesomeness of yacht racing in a Midwestern paper. And that really made a big impact on me. And then was further reinforced by the uh, great ESPN coverage by Gary Jobson, in the middle of the night, as many of you recall, watching from the States, the great action in Fremantle. So in the great and fun and super colorful 167-year history of the Cup, there have been lots of characters. Talk about some of the characters that, that are favorites for you and that are colorful in the history of the Cup. Yeah, one of my favorites is uh, Harold Vanderbilt. Uh, Mike Vanderbilt, as he was known affectionately by his friends, uh, you know, was... Uh, you know, one of the scions of the great Vanderbilt family. He uh, attended Harvard Law and uh, graduated very quickly uh, and immediately got engaged in uh, not law, but uh, bridge playing and yacht racing. Uh, Vanderbilt's greatest successes were like in the middle of the 20th century, you know, from after World War I and spilling into uh, the late 30s. And he was known for his extraordinary um, ruthless and uh, you know, sharp-minded ways of trying to win the cup. And I just want to share one quick story with you. Uh, to give you an understanding of his character, in, in 1934, we had the Royal Yacht Squadron, no less, challenge the America's Cup. Tom Sopwith of Sopwith Camel fame challenged with the Yacht Endeavor. And Vanderbilt defended the cup with the Yacht Rainbow. Prior to the building of those yachts, Sopwith and Vanderbilt met for a gentleman's agreement. All right, is there something wrong with the? Okay, good. Vanderbilt and Sopwith, prior to building their respective J-boats, made an agreement saying, you know what, to save money, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's make it so that our crew can live aboard the boat. You know, we've got to have bathtubs. We've got to have uh, wash basins. Let's make it a cruiser sailor. <laughs> yeah. And Vanderbilt and Sopwith, okay, good. They shook hands and all good. Well... About nearly a year later, right at the eve of the 1934 match in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, both Sopwith and Vanderbilt got together to inspect their uh, respective yachts. So Vanderbilt <coughs> went on board Sopwith's Endeavor, got a wonderful tour, all good. Then things got a little bit shaky. Sopwith then went aboard Rainbow, Vanderbilt's boat, and Vanderbilt showed off the rig and the deck, and they went down below. 
And then Sapodo's like, where, where's the wash basin? Where are the, the bathtubs? You know, what's going on here? And the van said, I, I've got them. We just got to keep going lower. And they went all the way to the bilge of the yacht. <laughs> and stuffed in the bilge was a, a bathtub and the wash basin and everything. <laughs> And here's what he said. He said, well, we agreed to have things like wash basins and tubs, but we did not agree that they have to be functional. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's one of my favorites. I, I can name so many more. I, you know, Tell us another favorite Ted character. Turner, well, Ted Turner, of course. Give us a many story. Many of you guys know yeah. Ted. Yeah, I had the wonderful opportunity <clears throat> to uh, meet with Ted and interview him at his office in Atlanta uh, several years ago. And... Uh, This is out, I think. Yeah. So I met with Ted, and you know he's one of those characters that no matter what you talk to him about, it's always going to be funny, hilarious, and uh, exciting. Like, let me. Say, I met him at his office, and we were sitting down, and and Steve, he said, "Steve, yeah, what you got?" You know, and I started asking questions about the cup. Then, in the middle of my questions, he would get up sometimes, and he would just walk around, around me. And he said, Steve, just keep talking, just keep talking. Then he would sit back down, and he would rock back and forth in his chair, which wasn't a rocking chair, by the way, get up and walk around. Eventually he said, I've got to take a whiz. And so he disappeared, came back. But he was really totally engaged. But he was somebody who was just really hyperactive, and was just really, really quite charming, actually. But one of the stories he told me that was just fun was how, um, how maligned he was with the yacht uh, uh, Mariner, which some of you may know. Yes. Yep. In 1974... He had the uh, unfortunate role of being the skipper of one of the absolutely one of the slowest 12 meter yachts ever made, the yacht Mariner. She had a stern that was like sliced off. It was like a fast back, but it really wasn't so fast. So it was just imagine like just taking a saw and just just cutting the stern off, just straight. Okay, it's a strange underbody right underneath. And uh, according to the tank test, it was a fast design. It, it supposedly tricked the water into uh, thinking that the boat had a longer water line, but it really didn't work that way. And I remember Ted telling me how he was at the, you know, he was helming the boat, and he said, it just doesn't feel right to me. And I like the fact that he was one of those sailors who had that natural touch. He can just feel it. So he took his cigarette, he said, and he threw it out in the back, and he said, the cigarette just kept on following me because the wake was so great. <laughs> and uh, as you know, he also, the, he also said the famous line, you know, even, you know, crap is tapered on both ends. <laughs> so, but the thing about Ted that I really like as a personality, he was also one of the rare and true uh, Corinthians of the sport. He wasn't involved in the America's Cup for money or fame. He just loved sailboat racing, and he was extremely good at it. And I just like the fact that he represented the New York Yacht Club very well in the 1970s, winning the cup in 77 with Gary Jobson. So the different source materials that you've uh, researched, talk to, me, talk to us about the books and manuscripts and historic items that you've found. And, and where is the source of, of lots of them, including the Squadron and NYYC? So talk a little bit about favorite source materials. Yeah, my favorite source materials are like letters, written by the competitors privately, not the official documents. Unfortunately, I was not able to share with you some of the personal letters that I found at the Royal Yacht Squadron's archives, because they're very, very sensitive. And they paint certain pictures, perhaps, in a way that may not be suitable. And if it's taken out of context, it's not a good thing. The squadron, of course, allows historians like myself to examine the materials, but we had to be very careful to, to uh, show them. You know, um, I, I wish I can get into further details on that, but uh, essentially, the personal letters are private often reveal things that cannot be found, in, of course, in the official press releases or subject matter of that sort. It shows the unvarnished truth of what an individual is thinking about. So, uh, as the saying went then, um, oh. Britain, Britain rules the waves, America waves the rules. Talk yeah. a little bit about that quote and about the circumstances that led up to it. Sure. So, the the famous line that some newspaper uh, editor or what have you coined back, I think, in the late 1800s, you know, you know Britannia, yeah, Britannia rules the waves, America waves the rules, <laughs> um, largely came out of the perceived and sometimes true notion that perhaps the New York Yacht Club mm -hmm. was taking the defense of the cup too seriously and was perhaps 
not being fair to the challenger. There were certainly cases of that. So for example, in the very first America's Cup defense in 1870, the New York Yacht Club defended the cup with a fleet of about 14, 15 yachts against the lone challenger. That's not fair. George Schuyler himself, who was still alive, said, this is ridiculous. So he stepped in and said, we can't have this, okay? He said, you, going forward, it's gonna be a one-on-one -on -one match race, not a fleet versus one poor challenger. Also in the early days, the uh, New York Yacht Club tended to hold their races in the so-called inside course, which, is, which starts around like um, just above the Narrows in the upper harbor of New York, where there's a lot of uh, currents, it's like, it's like the Solent, and then you run down the Narrows, which is between, again, Brooklyn and Staten Island, then you go out into the lower bay, and you round a, a point down there and out into the ocean and come back. But the point is, that's an area where there's a lot of shoals and currents, and it's extremely difficult for a challenger to be successful. And the challengers always felt abused having to race in, that, in those conditions. Now, why the challengers did not pick up local pilots, I don't know. <laughs> but they preferred to use their own sailors to their detriment. Eventually, one of the challengers, Lord Dunraven, put his foot down and said, this is ridiculous. I don't want to race in the inside course. We're going to race on the ocean. And the club actually acquiesced. Over time, the New York Yacht Club became more and more hospitable to the challengers. And by the time you get into the 12-meter era, they were quite classy and very fair, through and through. So we're visiting today with Steve Sushia, uh, yachting historian and chairman of the America's Cup Selection Hall of Fame Selection Committee. And we're going to take some questions from the audience, the first of which will be from our Commodore, Commodore Brander. Hi, Steve. Thank yeah. you, Ron. And uh, Steve, really fascinating information and talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, question I have is history is kind of relative, and it, it usually is uh, whoever decides to write it down creates the history in some way. What was the most surprising or fascinating thing in all your research that you found out when you actually reviewed the documents? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is very controversial, and I get a lot of... Um, yeah, this is not something that's easy to talk about, but I would say the controversy over the winged keel, the parentage of the winged keel. You've, you've slipped is, in the Netherlands tanks. Is the, um, has been the most vexing, right, is the most vexing thing. So let, let me put this in context. In 1983, when Australia too won the cup, there were rumors swirling around that the Australian boat was not fully designed by a national of Australia, which was required in the rules at that time. And that that the designer, Ben Lexon, the brilliant Ben Lexon, was assisted by uh, scientists and engineers in the Netherlands, the Dutch. And there are, to this day, there are many Australians in particular, but also great journalists like Bob Fisher, who I respect completely, who absolutely believe Ben Lexon was the sole designer of that yacht. And that if you say anything otherwise, that's not a, you know, you're gonna get in a fight. Well, doing research at the primary source level by interviewing members of the Australia Two Team. So I went to Australia back in 2007 or so, and I met with uh, John Bertrand, who was the skipper of Australia Two. I met with John Longley, who was the project manager of Australia Two. I met with Steve Ward, who actually built Australia Two. Did you meet with Snackerberg? Uh, not uh, in a later time, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, but it was interesting because Bertrand and Longley said that Ben Lexon said that he did get assistance from the Dutch. You absolutely. Okay, and I've got that on tape, you know. Right. And that, but it was more of an, but it wasn't like anything really serious. It was more like one of the stories, you know. Longley said. Ben Lexon said, so it's like a Chinese whisper, or what they call these things, that Ben said, I was at the Dutch Netherlands tank, which I was permitted to by the New York Yacht Club to test models of Australia too. And I was kept banging my head because I was trying to design an upside down keel or a keel that's more efficient, and I just couldn't find a way to reduce the drag. Then he said, and also, then a Dutch bloke, quote, Dutch bloke came along and 
help me solve the problem by you know, incorporating wings to reduce drag and among other things. Bertrand said something similar to that effect as well. I don't have the tapes with me, so I can't articulate exactly. But the point is, even the members of the Australian team believe that there was some assistance from the Dutch. And of course, I went to the Netherlands to meet with Peter van der Sannen and, and Joop Sloof, who were the two people credited mostly for involved, involving in the design. And they provided me with documentary evidence of their research, photographs of their tank testing, and their notes that they developed prior to even well before 83 that they were already thinking about the short waterline length of Australia too and light displacement ideas. So that, that would be the most, sorry, that, this is my long-winded response, but we can talk more, but that's the most compelling one. We have a question, Paul Kamen. Hi, um, spirit of friendly competition notwithstanding, uh, it seems clear that the, you know, the one and a half centuries of protests, lawsuits, controversies, scandals, are what's uh, given the America's Cup all the ink on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and that's really what's kept it in the public eye. Uh, even before the America was launched, there was a, a, an argument over the launch date, which they missed. Uh, there was the price being reduced because right. it didn't win the sham race that was set up with the Maria. Yeah. And that this set the stage for most of, the, most of the challenges and defenses that followed, which almost always had an acrimonious protest or something that... Uh, the pundits all claimed would, quote, ruin the America's Cup, but in fact, that's what kept it in the public eye and what kept it so important. Now, do you think there's danger that if the America's Cup becomes too well managed and too well run and we avoid the scandal and controversy, <laughs> yeah. do you think there's danger that it will fade from the public eye and be just another sailboat race? <laughs> This is a question not asked by a lawyer, but by a naval architect. <laughs> well, first, I want perspective, yeah. Paul. <laughs> well, Paul, I want to first say, I don't think that there's no evidence to suggest I believe, that, or um, I don't even want to use the word believe, but there's no evidence to suggest that race between Maria and America in 1851 was a sham race, though. I mean, I think Maria was truly a faster boat under those conditions. Oh, yeah, but you know. it was overrigged and it was a lighter specialty boat. Oh, yeah, sure. She but could just say, but it was still, right, but it was right. still just a right. But we can argue about why did they use that boat versus a flight, a more suitable boat, understood. But, but anyway, to get to the meat of the matter, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think unfortunately in some countries like the United States, I think the public interest in the cup has already declined anyway. So I don't think uh, it will be much of a difference. Like what I'm trying to say is this, back in the 1800s, even uh, Midwesterners in Illinois were fascinated by the America's Cup. In fact, there was a manufacturer of coffee in Illinois, the Oakford Company, that branded their coffee, the America's Cup coffee. And they were selling it not to East Coasters or Californians or whatever, but to Midwesterners, because it was so famous and popular, and the cup had captured such an incredible imagination of the public. And it, we don't see that today anymore. Uh, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad or good, it's just the, the world has changed. Um, but to really get at your question, do you, I think it would be diminished if, if the scandals and the controversies go away? Me personally, yeah. I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the great and interesting things about the Cup is the sheer controversy and the fact that you have these egomaniacs, perhaps, who are used to winning and wants to win at all costs and they will do whatever it takes and that creates interesting situations. I want to see that continue. It's kind of like the heritage of the Cup, as you correctly stated. It's been like that since the beginning. And we have another question from the audience. Sure. Uh, you mentioned, and I thought it was very interesting, that there was a difference in the sailcloth used in the original America's Cup. Now, I've heard a rumor that we would not allow the British to use Dacron or our competitors to use Dacron. Is there any truth to that? It was, was that before just Dacron. Or old wives' tale? Well, it, what you're speaking about is in reverse to the 12-meter era yes, the, since the 50s. Yes, exactly, yeah. in the 12-meter mm -hmm. era. Yep. Uh, after the war, we had Dacron, they didn't. Right. Yeah, I don't have the full record in front of me, but I do know this. I do know that in 1958, which was the first 12-meter uh, America's Cup series. Columbia. With Columbia. Uh, during that first tranche, the New York Yacht Club was very strict about making sure that the competitors complied with the rule that the boat must entirely be designed and built by the country of origin, right? 
And that did create controversy. Yeah, so the answer is yes, that was a case. I don't know if it was Dacron in particular, but it was certain materials. But in 1962, uh, when Gretel challenged from Australia, the New York Yacht Club was kind enough to actually permit certain sail cloth. And so really, actually, over time, the New York Yacht Club relaxed a lot of the requirements, although there was one point where they went back into make it tighter as well. And Tom can tell you a lot of that. He was very knowledgeable about the uh, writing the rules. Yeah. But, but like, for example, there was a time when um, uh, there was a man named Andy Rose, <laughs> which all you know. He, uh, I think it was, in, yeah, it was in the 1980 Cup, he, uh, was, he joined the Australian team. He was like the hired gun from America because of his great sailing skill, as many of you know. And that actually uh, concerned the New York Yacht Club. So the year afterwards, they said, every member on board the crew must be a national. And that was called the Andy Rose Rule. So there has always been a little bit of give and play. Does that answer your question? Julia, we have a question from social media. We do. Uh, Mark Wharton Reed asks to tell us about the America's Cup book you've been collaborating on with Alan and how many have been finished and what book are you currently working on? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, when he said Alan, I think he's referring to Alan Granby. Yep. So, well, I'm working right now on a massive <laughs> nine volume history of the art and artifacts of the America's Cup. In fact, I'm going to step and show you a copy that I brought with me. Now, you just happened to have, we yeah, just brought it here. And by, this, is, this is not a set of questions. I don't know what, it's just <laughs> weird. I just brought it because I just want to show this to people. He, About 10 years ago, uh, Bill Koch, who you all know, who won the Cup in 92, he uh, initiated a, a project to make a magnificent series of coffee table books to showcase art and artifacts with America's Cup from 1851 to the present. And he hired Alan Granby and Janice Highland, who are the absolute masters of making high quality coffee table marine art books. And uh, in turn, Alan Granby and Janice hired me, and, as well as Dyer Jones and Louis Howland to serve as historical editors on this massive project. Because it spans such a long period of time, and because we're dealing with so many different <clears throat> elements and facets of the cup, um, there, were several, there were a couple of us historical editors on this massive project. And I just want to share with you what I brought with me is volume number one of this nine-volume series. And this volume just covers the 1851 race, and that's why I brought it with me. And uh, here what I want to do is I want to just show a couple sample pages. <laughs> Steve's been our house guest, and Barbara looked at the books and said, Honey, this is a great house guest. <laughs> Look what he brought. <laughs> but remember, I've, I've been paying for some of the meals, you see. So, uh, Even that's good. It's nice, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But as you can see, this is a, uh, a wonderful book. Um, Spectacular feature. book. See, look, that's actually the eagle from the stern of the Yacht America. Which is now in the New York Yacht Club. Right. So essentially the purpose of this book is to show primary visual sources of the America's Cup from things like what I call chotskis, you know, like from beer cans and uh, you know, perfume bottles, all the way to the fine art that's out there, and trophies and components of boats also to serve as an educational tool by showing like these, some, in some cases, unpublished lines plans of some of these boats. So we have some lines plans of the sail plan of Yacht America. Uh, but one of my favorite pages, I want to show you. And incidentally, the color reproduction is literally spectacular. Of all the talks we've had on the AC, uh, Steve, yours today has brought the greatest visuals. I mean, really Thank you. amazing, well-researched, Terrific original visuals, very, very beautiful c color reproductions. Oh, look at this. Now, this is a fun, if you can maybe raise it, I don't know if people can see, but this is a, uh, these are models from Bill Koch's personal collection. Right. These are the boats that raced in that 1851 race. <laughs> He's got a fully rigged model of every America's Cup boat that's competed from 1851 to the present. And this is a wonderful way to visualize and see the hull shapes and uh, 
the tonnage of these various craft that race in that, that, that first race. Of all the winners of and the then, Cup, Bill has taken an incredible, great, um, put great effort into um, representing the Cup well in things like this project. Now, for volume one, I also wrote a section on the Dita gift because it was always my dream to showcase the original document for scholars, no matter where you're on the planet, to look at it and study it. And so I had a professional photographer take the images of all the key documents in the archives of the New York Yacht Club, and I had it presented in this fine volume. So the last, like, 20% of the book is kind of like a book within a book that I wrote, and, and I must thank Alan and Janice for giving me that opportunity. But, um, so for example, we have, um, well, chronology, but you, know, you can see that here's that notorious deed, you know, with the cross li line. And so I have all the key documents displayed in there. So anyway, so that's the, the project that we're working on right now. We've got seven volumes already printed, and it's just sitting in warehouses. And we've got two more volumes to go. The, the ninth volume will go all the way up to 2013. And hopefully we'll get that done before the next America's Cup in 2021. So, so this so. has been the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Our speaker today has been Steve Sushia, historian, author, and chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Steve, what a great talk. Thank you so much. The Thank luncheon you. is adjourned. Good on you, mate. Good on you. Good job. Good job.